Hello, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar of Tries and Trades. I hope everybody's keeping safe and well. Before we begin, I, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen are multiple application engagement tools you can use. All engagement tools are resizable and movable, so feel free to move them around to get the most out of your desktop space. You can expand your slide area or maximize it to full screen by clicking on the arrows in the top right corner. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A engagement tool. We will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, we'll make sure we email these to you. Please know we do capture all questions. Additional materials are available on the resource list. We encourage you to download any resources or links that you may find useful. For the best viewing experience, we recommend using a wired internet connection and closing any programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause issues. Webinars are bandwidth intensive, so closing any unnecessary browser tabs will help converse your bandwidth. The webcast is being streamed to your computer, so there is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presenters. Some network causes slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. If your slides are behind, pushing F5 on your keyboard will refresh the page. You can find additional answers to some common technical issues located in the help engagement tool at the bottom of your screen. An on-demand version of this webcast will be available approximately one day after the webcast and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. So, my name is John Lee. I am the Business Development Director for the Refinitiv Accelerator. I will be your moderator today. And it is my genuine pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel. So on the left of my screen, we have Tom Batchelor, Head of Sports Science at Harlequins Rugby Club. Give us a wave, Tom. Fantastic. Next, we have former Wallabies and Harlequins captain, James Hallwell. Big smile, James. Thank you. And it is a pleasure to introduce Sally Epstein, Head of Strategic Technology at Cambridge Consultants. Quick wave, Sally. Thank you. And last but not least, we have our very own Jeff Horrell, Head of London's Refinitive Labs. Good afternoon, Jeff. And a nice wave from Jeff too. Thank you. So let's kickstart this session with Tom, perhaps. Um, Tom, you spent a number of years in sports as a strength and conditioning coach, and now as a lead sports scientist at Quinn's. Prior to this, you had spent some time in financial markets yourself. How is data becoming more prevalent in sports, and in particular for rugby, and how does the Harlequins use the data to become a more data-driven organization? Um, so I think, like all industries, data is fairly uh, pervasive now in terms of sport and especially in terms of rugby union. Like We have uh, a team of five full-time analysts who will look at the game from mainly using video to collect the data. So that's like a number of tackles, clears, uh, line-outs, etc. Um, and that will all be coded. And then all of the opposition games will be coded and all the other games practically every weekend will be coded, which then gives us a data bank to look through in terms of sort of tactical information. Um, and then I lean on that as well to look at um, how best to prepare players. So if you're looking at someone like in uh, James's position, like how many rocks do they hit, how often they ask to carry, how many uh, tackles they ask to make, how many moves and that stuff. And that gives us data kind of to work back from in terms of physically preparing the guys. Um, and then in terms of um, data collection that I'm directly responsible for, um, every morning the boys will be asked to fill out wellness questionnaires. So that's energy, mood, soreness, um, previous injuries, uh, and this gives us our, our physiotherapy team and our performance team a sort of early flag on any issues they need to get ahead of, um, whether that's from an injury perspective or also from like an energy and mood perspective. Um, but to be honest, in that area, we probably still lean a lot on our relationships with players because uh, it's hard to address how someone feels on a scale of one to five. But what it does do for us is it does allow us to know when someone is flagging that they've got an issue and allows us to have a further conversation. Um, and then the stuff that's probably more prevalent in the media is the GPS and heart rate data. So every training session, every match that the boys do, they will have a little GPS unit, which is the lump you might see on the back of a shirt. Um, and that will transmit uh, accelerometer data and GPS data, which allows us to know how fast the guys are do going and then sort of what kind of running zones they're working in. And likewise with the heart rate data as well. Um, 
that is actually picked up in real time. You'll see at most rugby games now, there'll be some guy sat on a bench with a laptop inside like a rainproof case and this weird looking antenna next to him. And that provides live data. We don't, I guess, from a philosophical standpoint, try to make too many decisions off the back of it because our overarching philosophy physically is to prepare guys so they can play 80 minutes. So if we get to a point where we need to pull someone off too early, that then means that we've probably failed part of our preparation phase. But that said, you do get into situations where you've got guys like uh, James who are fairly integral to the squad when they're with us and they might have played a lot of minutes in the last few months and therefore you do start to look at what's coming back live to try and help inform the coaches. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's the same as I think everyone's industry. Like, if there's an app, we'll use it because it makes life easier. Um, I and mean, then a lot of it then basically becomes down to how we're able to collate and then analyze that data to inform decision-making. So it very rarely leads the, the decision-making, but it is, I think, an integral part. I think it's one of those things that... Um, from anyone who's read the sort of Moneyball stuff about sort of early 2000s baseball, uh, there's quite a good chapter in there where like it's, it's no longer about sort of stats guys and uh, pure sport guys. Like the stats have become so in, inbred into the sport that you can't really have a conversation without them. Um, but I think that's the, the key bit I've, I've sort of developed over the years is you start trying to pick out what's useful and what's noise. Um, because I think like any space, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, companies making, especially in fit, sort of fitness and health industries, making a lot of claims about what things can and can't do. Yeah. So I think part of our yeah. job is then filtering that out for the coaches because our coaches are the same as anyone else. They'll, they're like Joe Public. They're exposed to the media and therefore they'll come in on a Monday morning sometimes and ask us why we're not using X or Y supplement they've read about in a reputable newspaper and then we will have to sort of spend 10 minutes sort of talking them down from some new, uh, new regime. But like, by and large, it's... It's so integral to what we do, it's almost hard to pick out what we do without it, if that makes sense. It really does. And and I, I like how you've um, touched on so many different angles. You know, you have the backwards looking and then you've got the forwards looking. Um, and the real time piece is really um, fascinating for me as well. Um, just out, out of interest, I'd, could you talk more about the mood and energy? That's not something that was previously looked at, if I'm right. It's more about sort of condition, energy, but mood is quite an interesting aspect to it as well. Yeah, I think there's there needs to be a wider acknowledgement that our population is no different from the rest of the human species. Like these guys go through ups and downs and it's important that there is added pressure to them. There's very few people who will have their performance reviewed or available to watch on TV every week and then reviewed by the national press. And that brings yeah. a unique set of um, pressures. But alongside that, these are guys are their fathers, their brothers their sons like life happens to them whilst all this goes on i don't per i think the questionnaires help in terms of acting as a flag but only you're always in touch with this type of stuff in terms of energy and mood you're gonna have to speak to the individual and know like some people like myself like i'm very much an up and down guy so my mood will be five or one and therefore if i was monitoring me i'd always speak to me when it was a one but i know that there's like that's that's what tom's like other individuals, you'll hear nothing from them for 18 months and then all of a sudden there'll be a flag and that's worth the conversation because it probably means something uh, something quite significant happened in their life. So it, I think it's acknowledged wider. Like you see guys like Jurgen Klopp who are very good people, people. Like they've got a high emotional IQ and that's, you know, ultimately what we do is a, a it's a data-driven people business. It's about getting 15 or 23 guys to put their body through quite considerable pain every weekend and then get up and do it again seven days later. So that that's where it's, it's mixing the objective and subjective data and acknowledging that both have value for us. Um, and I think that's a development that's happened probably sport-wide recently. Um, and, you know, we've got to look after them. They're young men and we've got young women in our uh, women's program as well. Like you've, You have to look after them first and foremost as a person, right? So that's what we try and do. I'm not saying we always succeed, that's what we try and do. Fantastic. And I love the way you've coined the term data-driven people business. Um, it's just so hum important, that human element alongside the data. So, Tom, that's really insightful. Thank you. Um, and just one more, one more question for you. What about the real-time side of things? I mean, the person in the box, I'm just picturing now it's raining, you're, you're down at the Harlequin Stadium. How does that operate? And how do you get that message from the box, from you to the box, to the pitch, to the player, to someone like James on the, on the field? 
Um, so with the physical stuff I'm looking at, we would never um, tell a player that they've done too much, too little, because your brain is an amazing regulatory mechanism when it comes to physical outputs. So you tell someone you're tired, you tell someone it's hard, you get a very different set of physical outputs versus telling someone that they're fresh and ready to go. Um, in terms of communication, it's real simple. Like all coaches have little earpieces in and then the relevant athletic performance guys, physios, etc. You'll often see it, if someone goes down with an injury, you'll often see a medic with a earpiece on and they're simply relaying information up, whether or not it's like a substitution, it's fine to carry on, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, like, as, as James can tell you, often the athletic performance staff are asked to pass on tactical information um, which I think can often lead to quite, uh, although we're in a serious, like a serious point of the game, maybe quite comical moments when you've got a guy whose primary primary job is to help the boys physically prepare, providing tactical information to a guy who's got several caps to Aust for Australia, etc. Um, I mean, we pass the message on whether or not I know what I'm saying every single time. I'll be honest with you; like, I do my best to know what what uh, rugby is, but like. Um, there's different levels of understanding. So, like, yeah, we, we try and pass on the messages. Whether or not I think James will have a better idea about how useful the messaging is, um, it's probably the better person to ask, to be honest. That's fantastic. Thank you, Tom. And actually, that's a, that's a good introduction for a, a fantastic human being. Um, James, <laughs> you've had an amazing career as a rugby player. 61, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, almost a decade with the Queensland Reds, and then some fantastic years with the Quins. Of your most recent achievements, including last year's victory over Oxford in the varsity match, and also being able to put me during the NBA lectures, um, could you share your experience with data and how your relationship with data evolved through the introduction of people such as Tom and sports science itself? I'd be particularly interested to know about how this may have ha helped you turn that into action in the field. Yeah, look, I think... Um... With data, I think the big thing for me from when I started out that it was it was probably when I started playing professionally, sort of early 2000s. It was uh, something that was mentioned, but wasn't particularly in rugby circles. Really, wasn't um, a focus, and and certainly throughout my career uh, is something that's really grown to become a prevalence. And I think there was a period there where we probably, as a game, or particularly the teams I was involved with, probably relied too heavily on it. And I think that's we're starting, as, as Tom was mentioning there, I think we were starting towards the back end of my career to find that middle ground. I think there was the obviously excitement with getting a lot more accurate data. I think that's the big thing, particularly around the GPS units now, that when they first started out, basically they could measure how far you ran and how fast you ran, and that was it. And now as the, the units and the, the capacity that they have to, to measure get better, you can measure things like how much force you're taking off each leg. Are they favoring a certain leg when they're returning from injury? The impacts that players take, the amount, and you can measure all this. And I think there was a there was a period there, probably sort of early 2010, 12, 11, 12 sort of area where this all started becoming a regular uh, occurrence in, well, in certainly the teams I was playing. And, and these were driving the decisions more so than the subjective element that Tom was talking about. And I still think that that is probably the most important part of, of rugby being a, um, and, and sport on any side that it's a, it's a, as Tom said, it's a, it's a people business we, we you're talking to people as individuals. They're not robots and they're while they're athletes and, and a lot of people can perform at a very high level and do things that people can't imagine other themselves doing, there's still a human there and after all. And I think the most important part of that for me is that it's working on the human elephant and the feelings and the subjective side of how people feel. And that, and that is also driven from a trust element throughout the culture of an organisation when the players feel that they can speak openly and candidly about how they feel, even though the, the, the data shows that, they, you know, look, you, you're still hitting the numbers that you've always hit, where, whether it's, as Tom said, your wellness, your, your, your numbers, your, your, your running loads and all this sort of thing, but you still in yourself don't feel great, there, there has to be a, you know, a mental element that comes into the game and shows that, you know, that the mental, the, the brain is a, is a wonderful tool. And, and, you know, we always say that, you know, most athletes know their body better than anyone else, better than any physio, better than any coach, and better than any sports scientist. So if 
particularly players that have been doing it for a long time, they have the ability to self-regulate. And I think that's the important part. And, and that's probably the biggest change I've seen in, in rugby. I think particularly in my career, when I started, as I said, early 2000s, you know, this sort of GPS, this that was very, very basic, very raw, not a lot of direction given to it. Um, and probably, if we're being honest, we didn't know what we were doing with it. Now, as we're growing in the, and it becomes more of a driving force, particularly with the, the working out of the, the game plans and, and the way that you review games, um, it becomes a big, big element. And, and players have access to that every, you know, every Monday you come in, you have a full stats sheet of the important elements of the game that each individual, you know, the coaches at, at that period or that, that club felt important. Now that changes from coach to coach to club to club and, and individual players want different sort of data to, to help what helps them. But I think in the end of it, I think that, you know, Tom hit the nail on the head. It, there is still this human element um, to a lot of it to, to get the best out of the individuals. Um, that's, I, I, yeah, and I, and I totally appreciate that. That's so important, having the data and the human element. And it's fascinating. I think you've lived in a really unique parts in, of, of data and the data evolution. You know, you've seen that change in sports go from mm. heavy rather than to balance finding the right medium with uh, the human element. James, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and perhaps you could, um, uh, some of your international and domestic experiences, and if you have any stories around the data or where it's succeeded really or where it's uh, failed. I mean, sorry to put you on the spot there, but uh, I'd love to as well. No, I think there's there's probably a couple of things there. I think in, initially with the data, you know, particularly if I'll go back to playing in Australia where we had, a you know, five state-based sides and then a national side, there was a period there where none of the state sides would share their data with the national setup. Now, that's probably an issue, uh, another issue that's, you know, probably bigger than this um, this webinar, but the, the, the data wasn't shared openly and I think across all the states and I think that, you know, from a from a national interest point of view, I think that's where there, there can be some issues. You're obviously, from a national side, as a as an Australian and a proud Aussie, you know, I want the Wallabies and everyone that supports rugby in Australia, and, and probably people that don't want the what the national side to win. And I think there were that that was a that was probably an issue that came past, and we we probably didn't get as much uh, flow because, you know, as Tom knows, when rugby is an interesting sport where you have the players are with one club for a period of the year, then a lot of them leave and go to another whole different setup that have different focuses, different data um, measures and what they're looking at to to try and and then you sort of doesn't match up. Now I think there's a there's a unified approach now, particularly in Australia, definitely across the states and the national team, which which I believe will help the national side from from a reviewing and understanding rugby point of view, a sport point of view. But in a sense, when it's worked well, um, I think I, there was always, look, I, I can speak sort of, I mean, this is pretty basic, but we used to have a, a, a back at the Reds when we were six, when we uh, won the comp, we used to have a, as, as captain, you make the decision to go, for you know choose what when you get a penalty on the field to shoot go for touch and go for for goal and i was always told prior to the games by one of our analysts that i used to get our goal kicker for that game or for that period what their success rate was from different sides of the field and from different parts of the field and what their percentage was throughout the season and through the the, the probably the year or two prior what they were kicking from certain sections of the field for goal and that used to drive my decision based on where we got a penalty, even though the, the kicker, as all kick, good kickers do tell me they, they're going to make every kick, um, was an element. So I knew that, for example, when we were kicking from the right-hand side of the field between the 15 and the touchline in between the 40 and the 22, his success rate dropped to about 43% when it's usually when you move 10 metres to the left of or 15 metres to the left of that, it rose to about 86% or 83%. Wow. So... That sort of data, for me, made my decision process on the field much easier because I'd look where the penalty was given and I wouldn't, in a thought process, go, well, no, my ch my chances of him getting this and making worth the decision was, was low, so I'd always elect to kick from touch for those sort of things. And just things like that, I think, 
is when it worked. Uh, and there's probably plenty of times when I can say when it was probably too much emphasis was paid on certain elements of, of the game that um, didn't probably have the, the benefit in the long run. But um, going back to the human side, the trust, the culture, really important stuff. Um, I'm still surprised that you remember the, the stats for your kicker. Um, you know, <laughs> finance, James. Oh. So, um, <laughs> that's a great uh, sort of trust, Jeff. Um, Jeff, perhaps I could move it over to you. Um, having partnered closely with the London Labs, I've seen some of the amazing work you guys do. I was personally very excited by the data exploration tool the labs created and you're really challenging and innovating the way we look at data. So my question to you is, you know, Tom mentioned earlier about the noise and being able to identify what the crucial data is. Um, and so with what Tom and James have said, what resonates with you in terms of your team's work to help financial services firms? I'd love to hear from you, Jeff. Yeah, and, and look, fascinating to see the, or look at this and see the similarities, actually. Um, you know, initially when Refinitiv did the deal, the partnership with Harlequins, I was like, well, you know, how are these things uh, similar? But actually, the more I hear from from Tom and from James, and obviously talking to to Paul Gustard previously, there's a lot of similarities. And I think part of it is the journey that people have been on. And, and you see, in financial services, we've always used a lot of data, right? Uh, but it's very often been, you know, with you know, very in, like quants. Uh, you know, hedge funds, you know, algorithmic trading, those kinds of use cases where it's all data kind of um, focus people working together. And, you know, now what you see is every business trying to sort of change and transform into becoming a driven business. So those data-driven insights and decisions are moving, if you like, from the back office into the front office. So executives want to make decisions that are, that are data-driven trying to get more data into your hands of your investment management teams, into your portfolio managers, and trying to sort of, you know, I guess sense check you know, all the decisions. And you need a different set of skills to do that, I think. And, and so what we've seen is the rise of the sort of the data scientist um, and the, kind of the, the type of data scientist who can bridge uh, the domain expertise, you know, the common sense, the the kind of common sense James was talking about, the common sense of when do I need to use this data and what's the business requirement and when is it useful, um, as well as the understanding and, and the understanding of the data and what its limitations are so you can make you know make better decisions. Um, and one of the things that we've seen, you mentioned that the data exploration tool, but you, know, you want to get that data into the hands of those people who are really close to that decision-making process. Um, so that they can then feel comfortable with the decisions that the data is driven. You don't. You can't just deliver you know, an algorithm or an answer and just expect people to follow it, because they're the ones who really understand you know, the decisions they're making, investment choices, and they want to understand the provenance of it. Um, and you know, just as you know, Tom was saying, you know, about the GPS devices. You know, maybe they weren't as accurate previously, and they didn't give you what you needed to know. Again, our customers come to us and say, well, where exactly does that data come from? So maybe they're using our, you know, maybe our new sentiment data, for example. You know, is the, is the market uh, feeling fear or joy? Are they positively negative? And you're using advanced, you know, machine learning and text analysis on uh, news data to drive decisions. But they always come back to, well, where does that data come from? How have you put that together? What's gone into that mix of the recipe to generate that data set? Because if I don't really understand it, I won't trust it as much. And I think so that, uh, you know, that kind of way of thinking is similar, right? You know, I'm, I'm taking data off the field, but if I'm going to put it in front of the coaching team, they have to trust that data. They have to understand where it's come from and, and bring their domain expertise into it. Um, and, and we see the same thing over and over particularly as we move to using more sophisticated data analysis techniques, uh, using more machine learning, that that question of, you know, the provenance of the data, what's the data strategy? How are you managing that data? How are you creating it? How are you tagging it? So I really understand where it's come from. Um, so I can trust it. it it's important. Um, 
you know, and, and as, as um, you know, as James just saying, right, ideally what you really want is for people to be sharing the data, right? So you need lots of different sets of data to come together for you to kind of deliver insights. Um, and we see that now people are using perhaps traditional uh, time series data. So I've got my pricing from the stock exchange. I've got my company fundamentals data. But for, for new areas, so for example, right now we're looking at um, carbon emissions, for example. So I want to understand the conditions of a company to know if it's an ethical investment. Well, I can use that data, but I start to want to use satellite data. Can I use satellite data to look at deep deforestation patterns? Well, then I need to use image recognition. I need to use really much more advanced machine learning type uh, techniques. I need to bring these data sets together uh, to get those insights. So it's interesting that you know data strategy, the trusting of the data, the domain, trusting the people who have the domain expertise who really know what they're doing, uh, and you have to find you know ways to communicate with them. Um, and so you know in the in the lab we do that a bit by having a mix of different skills. We've got you know our research science team and our data science team. We've also got people who really focus on user experience and you know what is the uh, understanding the problem and understanding the, the customer use case. We bring those disciplines together. It's so important that you have that that marriage so you can deliver something that is that is useful. Thank, thank you, Jeff. That's really insightful. I mean, the bit about the strategy really really bodes with me. And and Sally, perhaps I could move over to you if that's okay. Um, you know, when, when Jeff talks about strategy and what it means um, with new technologies coming through, and how do we bring all this together? Um, Sally, I, I know Cambridge Consultants does some amazing work. I recently looked at your exciting project using AIs to better proteins. Um, the AI techniques allow to iterate from existing proteins to make them better than their siblings in a much, much faster time. Who would have thought? Um, so using AI and ML to understand and manage data, it allows data to create new insights and predictions. It would be great if you could share some thoughts around this, Sally. Yes, thanks. Um, yeah, and the protein design problem is a great one because it's something that if we are to try and mutate from known proteins or enzymes, it takes people at the lab thousands and thousands of tests to change tiny, tiny components to try and make the protein better at something. Um, proteins are the fundamental building block. Um, some of the examples you see in industry are types of enzymes that break things down. So if the problem is let's make this protein at breaking something down. Um, it used to all have to be done manually, but now we're using AI techniques. The same kind of techniques that Jeff mentioned for sentiment analysis of text, we're applying those same techniques to the sequence of proteins because all they really are are a series of letters. We'll gloss over the complications of structure and the quantum mechanics, but it's, just showcases what is possible with AI. But more commonly around us, we're seeing machine learning everywhere. It powers the recommendation system of Google. Um, we're seeing radiologists use imaging technologies to better detect diseases. And oh, we, we all know about serial excerpt. So that's NLB, NLP techniques so that we can communicate better. But when we get to the problem of data and business, I think AI and ML isn't going to be the silver bullet. It's, we're seeing time and time again that some of the outputs you get aren't always true. They can be misleading. So I'll tell you about some of the work that we've done in clinical trials. So it's a really interesting area because the cost of clinical trials, phase two, for example, is so high. It can cost approximately eight to $20 million for each phase two trial. And 80% of them fail. The reason that all of them are complicated, it can be to do with drugs, it can be to do with lots of complicating factors. But one of them is for every person that enters in a trial, there's a 30% dropout. And one of the leading factors is stress. So you can see there's already quite a few similarities to the world of sport where the focus there is to optimize wellness and health. Here, we're trying to prevent stress. So you can measure stress. There's clinically acceptable methods such as the perceived stress scale, but that involves a clinician taking measurements maybe daily, 
weekly or on an ad hoc basis. So one of the problems that we tackled as a business was designing a system that could measure and monitor and output a single useful value of stress that the clinicians could actually act on. So we developed the system, which once again has a lot of similarities to the work Tom's done at Quinn's. You can't just take in um, physiological data. For example, just heart rate isn't going to tell you if this person is stressed. We had to take in psychological data, take, use um, acquired via an app. Um, and actually, the two most important types of data that we identified were voice and EMG. And we were only able to define those types of data with the help of clinical psychiatrists and neuroscientists. So the data that we collected was amalgamated for this purpose and because we needed to understand stress. And we knew that no single marker of stress is going to tell us what is going on with this person. But at the same time, if we hadn't carefully curated the data, it could, give, could have given us very false results. So say, if we collected hair color or left or right handedness, that's very easy to see correlation in the results, which aren't related to causation. And this is a very human understandable problem. But when you deal with the sort of more abstract na nature of maybe a complicated financial model, you can see how inaccuracies or errors propagate when you can't do a sanity check at the end. And what was great about this result is that we were able to get good results in real time output to the clinicians so they could take action. So I use this example to show that you need a lot of care when curating the data for their purpose. It's really only as valuable as what you're trying to achieve. Um, and if I make it sound simple, it's not. That's not my intention. Um, and there's some great examples of really great companies with the smartest people who are well backed, IBM, Watson for one, and they have been trying to crack into the healthcare market for about a decade now. So about eight years ago, they were sort of lauded as being the ones who are going to diagnose your cancer. They're going to hack the genome. They're going to achieve all these things. And they have tried and tried again because they've got in with a broad, we'll take in all your data style approach. Whereas fundamentally, I think you have to be more selective in your approach, similar to some of the other examples that we've seen today. That's really fascinating because Jeff talks about the strategy around the data as well. I can see that, you know, Sally, you highlighted the context is just as important and tying in what Jeff said around the, the importance of the source and being able to trust. And trust is a word that's actually come up across all our panelists today. And I, I really find that really insightful. Um, I just want to thank you so much for that, Sally. If I may pause for a second, I just want to check the time. Um, everybody on the call today, thank you very much for joining. Um, we, you know, let's see how we're doing in terms of questions from the audience. Um, Dan and Chiara, if you're, if you're there, I'd love to see if we've got any questions coming through. Thanks, John. Yeah, we've had a, a few questions come through, but I mean, uh, we've got plenty of time for more. So, so if anyone has any questions, please do submit them uh, through the Q&A box. Um, one uh, particularly interesting one um, uh, talks about, you know, the longer term use of data in rugby is perhaps more obvious in terms of analysing what happened during a game on Saturday. Um, but the, the question is interested to know whether there are any examples of where data might change or drive a change on the fly during a game um, where data can be analysed on a more live basis um, to predict outcomes rather than simply looking backwards. I guess that's one for, for, for James and Tom. Thank you. I think I was going to I was going to point that one at you, Sally. But actually, I might I might, I might get revert to uh, Tom and Tom and James for this one. Tom, James, if you if you guys would like to go, Sally, you're very welcome to uh, give it a stand. I'll leave it to the pros. <laughs> um, I think like one of the things that happens quite often, I think James can probably attest to this as well, is that the analysts will see in real time whether or not. Uh, the way defences are covering certain things or sometimes even right down to the referee and what he's penalising. So often that gets fed in, like, look, the referee is really hot on X, so potentially, like, change your strategy around the breakdown, et cetera, and stuff like that in terms of using it real time. I think because of the chaotic nature of the game, like, the sort of predictive element is something we stay... Um, 
probably quite strongly away from because we just find that I think touching on what Jeff and Sally have already said is like the data we collect at the moment and uh, James hit the nail on the head is like we're still quite at an early stage in sport science and sport in general. So baseball, where like the famous example with Moneyball, is fairly simple because when it's a very simple, most binary relationship. The pitcher throws a pitch and it's either getting hit, it's a strike, it's a no ball. And that's it. So then all of a sudden the rest of the relationships to the game become fairly easy to then predict out and you can kind of attribute like wins and losses to runs. Whereas in rugby, you can have some real bizarre stuff happen. Like last year, the wind held up a kick that bounced off a post that then Joe March and ran in and caught and scored a try, like a, a, almost a, I think it was a game winning try, or it certainly like led to us having the game winning score. That kind of stuff is much more hard to pick out in rugby because it's, it's much richer. Um, and I think it's a slightly more complicated. But like in terms of the real-time stuff, like certainly tactically there's a lot that gets fed in. And I think the key bit at the moment actually is picking out the right stuff to then feel through to the guys on the pitch. Like like James, like he's just spent 40 minutes having his head stamped on. Like he, you need to be very selective about what you then feed into the guy because he's not probably got – like he, he's, he's probably trying to catch his breath, trying to figure out who hit him last. I mean, he's got some sports analyst or a coach coming up to him and giving him too much to remember. It's more effective. So the communication has to be really effective. But in terms of real-time stuff, that's probably what we go to most. Hmm. Yeah, I'll just add on that. I think the, the tactical part is obviously a big part of the game that where the coaches and the, the element come in. I think touching on where Tom was speaking on about the live sort of physical data um, is something that we don't really touch on I don't think a lot in rugby because the game does change a lot well I think if you look at other sports and I know Tom was talking about baseball but for example in, in Australia say AFL where they are now driving a, a lot of because they have a, a high substitute rate so you, you have about 120 subs per game so it's almost like a rolling sub bench they use ways of the physical data to, to understand when to make decisions on players that what they would call as flagging. And they've probably, compared to rugby, have a lot more depth of data where they come from. They've probably been using, you know, particularly physical GPS data for a lot longer and have a, probably a better understanding of what the individuals are like. And probably the other part is that the athletes are a lot more similar across the board in, in, in AFL. Um, whereas if you look at rugby, there is a distinct difference between what a front rower looks like and a, and a winger and a fullback or a halfback. The, their, their makeup and the way that they play the game and their needs in the game are much different. Whereas in a game like AFL or baseball, or you know, the, while there's differences in body shapes, most of the athletes are very similar. And I think that's what makes rugby unique. That It's very hard to make a, a blanket decision on individuals if they hit this amount of metres per second or for over this period of time, we're going to make a decision to either remove them from the field or what have you, because what a prop covers and what a halfback or a fullback or a winger covers are completely different, but the physical load is, is very high, regardless whether the numbers are high or not. And it's just probably not that measurable. Things like scrums, malls, take a lot out of the body, body physically that you can't probably measure that impressively when you look at a data sheet and say, oh, look, you know, this guy ran 10K in this game and this many, you know, he was hitting this many metres per second for, for this block of time. So I think it, rugby, I don't think, will get to the stage where, you know, using the example of AFL where they make decisions in advance based on the, the physical data of, um, of individuals. Yeah, I think what Kev said is, like, uh, James, sorry, I keep calling him Kev. Um, <laughs> it, it's on there, like, it's... The thing with AFL is it's heavily a running on eight sports. The GPS unit gives you really good data about what's causing the fatigue, potentially. Whereas James just said, like, for a prop, the running statistics aren't very impressive at all, but I certainly wouldn't want to do 18 scrums in one game. Well, I wouldn't want to do one scrum in one game. So, like, the, the more you actually get, you get in physically is not always as uh, pertinent to the, the type five forwards as it is to a back. And I think that's why you'll see some sports like AFL and football where the sort of running-based information is way more important because that's what drives fatigue. Whereas in rugby, it's basically a, a pain management sport. You kind of get tired because you've been hit so many times. You don't actually, outside of like the back three, you don't actually run that far, um, especially compared to AFL. AFL, they probably clock up close to what our boys get in a week, they'll do in one game. So it's making sure you can align the data you're collecting with the thing you're worried about. So if you're worried about fatigue, um, 
you need to have a data set that relates directly to the activities that lead to that fatigue. And for us at the moment, counting scrums, et cetera, is very much a post activity. Like obviously you can count them in real time, but when it then comes to like looking at loads and stuff, it's done much more after the game rather than during the game. Thank you, thank you. Um, thanks for that, Tom and James. Really insightful. Actually, there's, there's some really fantastic questions coming through. So I think we're gonna we're gonna kind of pick some of these out. And there's some some really insightful rugby rugby comments and questions coming through. But if I may just perhaps point to Jeff and Sally for the next one. Um, and the question is, what are the best ways to deal with data that is patchy or you don't trust? And the reason why I quite like this question is, you know. Tom and James, as they were telling their stories, there's a lot of, you know, you have to understand the data and what's driving, what's the real meaning behind it. So, um, you know, feel free to jump in, Tom and James, but I think I'd love to hear from Sally and Jeff in terms of trusting the data and the patchiness of data. I mean, absolutely, you know, one of the things, you really can't work with the data until you've done that analysis, right? You have to really understand where it's come from and, you know, back, you know, saying right back to the device, the source of it, you know, what is it monitoring? You know, we look at, when we look at, like I mentioned, news data, for example, you know, well, you know, what language is it coming in? Who's writing it? Where are they based? You know, what are they observing? Uh, what's their mandate, you know, uh, for covering uh, the news output? So are you introducing bias in your data, even from, from, from the get-go with the particular sources of information that you're using? So it's really important to, um, to understand that and I guess in terms of there's lots of you know clever statistical techniques uh, that you can use uh, to overcome some of those challenges um, but again it has to be you have to justify using those techniques against you know do I just need to switch data source or do I need to do an, a different activity to generate or create um, a, a new data um, sorry Sally I think you were going to add something yes um so this, it's, you can see trust in terms of sort of understanding the data. And you can also take the approach where you have no sort of on the physical layer. How do you trust the data? How do you trust that it's being correctly conveyed? It hasn't been tampered with, um, that all the data has been sent across. So there's some real time problems that you may come up against. And you can do clever stuff with the protocol. So sort of say that I send this type of data, you send it across, and then you go, did, did you get the same kind of data that I sent across? Um, but increasingly, the trend is to, towards computing things towards the edge to redu reduce that traveling time or reducing the where it could be lost. Similar to this video stream today, we may come across as a bit gappy, lossy. You may be missing sentences. So how can you trust what we were really trying to convey? Um, so that is an ongoing problem that's unsolved. Thank you, Sally. Um, great question. Going so touching back to rugby, and actually this is ties in with the trust in the data. Um, George asked, um, directed at Tom initially, but I'd love to open up to the panel. How do you deal with players that aren't interested in data and want to use more traditional techniques? And and I'd love to challenge um, Jeff and Sally in their respective industries as well. But perhaps if we start with Tom on that question, please. Um, in terms of how do we go around working with coaches and athletes who don't believe in data, I think like the the athletes an interesting one because in some ways like and now that uh, James is retired, I can probably say this in front of him. Like in some ways, you don't always want to let them know when they're near a perceived limit in terms of like physical outputs because they may just be about to surpass them. Like in terms of how hard they can work, etc. So you have to be careful with sort of almost preempting and causing them to have not a loss of belief but like not allowing them to really push the edge of it obviously that's got to be balanced with risk and injury and like that's something that's been very difficult in terms of when it comes to working with with coaches that's probably where it's more important i think the the, the key part of that is obviously what i try to do is find out what they want to know so i imagine it's what happens with you guys in a business sense is you're trying to figure out what your client or your, in my case, this coach wants to know. And if I can find a sort of project or um, a problem that I can help him solve, then I've probably then got a basis to build a relationship on. And then from there, what I always try and do is rather than 
sort of dismissing or not listening when someone goes off on a tangent, I try to actually have like a thorough debate with them. So I think like how often what I, from my experience has been with coaches is sometimes like um, James alluded to, like sports science has gone down various different tracks in the past. And sometimes these have been sort of dead ends and therefore coaches will have a perception of what it can offer. So when I first came in, I think most coaches perceived sports scientists as being the person who's always going to tell them, don't do too much this is a risk, don't do that, don't push the limits. Whereas I think it's probably flipped on its head now where our kind of way of thinking is that the the more you can expose these guys to the high intensities of a game during the training week in the correct doses, the more prepared and more safely prepared they are for the games. And therefore, when you sort of sit down with a coach, it's about having an honest discussion to sort of actually figure out what they're trying to figure out. Because quite often they'll come think, thinking like, oh, I've seen this in another environment where sports science says it can figure out this. And it may be something that I disagree with or it may be that they've, they don't think that data set works and I can sort of explain to them why I don't think that data set worked to answer their question and then potentially propose other ways of answering that question. I think the key part in all of this in terms of how do you get someone to buy in that you need to get them to buy in is, is actually to have that discussion because I can't presume or I definitely don't presume from a rugby perspective that I have any idea what it takes to win a game of rugby like I'm always there in an advisory capacity so all I see my job as is sort of problem solving and using data in the best way possible uh, to inform that decision making process and what I the last bit I'll say is I think it's ironically when coaches often come to me or people say to me oh, I'm not data driven what they I think often mean is that they are skeptical about um, what a lot of people would sort of term like black box thinking. So like what Jeff touched on earlier, like if someone doesn't understand the nuts and bolts of how you're getting to your answer, you're inclined not to trust it. And that is definitely me. Like I won't trust anything that a tech supplier gives us. They don't tell me what the algorithm is doing. Um, I think that's natural. I think that's inherent to most intelligent people's working so when it comes to then dealing with a coach i think like it would be incredibly arrogant of me to be like no nah, nah, just trust me on this one this is what it is so my job is educating or not even educating because that's kind of condescending but it's talking with them about what the problem is and then trying to go through my process with them and usually i think when two sides discuss what they're doing in a logical manner you often come out with like an agreed principle about how you're going to approach a problem and then it's just a matter of putting that uh, solution in place and then reviewing it so i think what used to happen in sports science would be that they'd be like oh we've solved this problem so now if you select these players we'll win and then there was never a, a continual renewal process of being like right does this algorithm formula whatever you've put in place from a data perspective actually do what it says like does it actually give you the result it says it does? It's like what happens with weather forecasting, right? They set, they take the data, they forecast forward what will happen, and then they'll continually review whether or not their uh, model actually provides the right weather um, forecast. And that's something that we're trying to do better and better so that actually you start to refine what matters, what doesn't matter, what does and doesn't have a relationship. Um, so that's where we're trying to go with it. And that's, I think, when you, have, when you make the coach part of that process and the athlete as well, if it's applicable, um, I think that's when you actually start going places because people are then all sort of going in one direction still with like a level of cynicism that's healthy in the process. Thanks, Tom. That's really insightful. Um, we're running short of time. So I think there's, well, I might take two more questions just uh, probably directed at James and then perhaps we could uh, follow through and, and thank you so much for your questions. There's some really interesting and challenging questions that we'd love to come back to you on. So we'll make sure we do come back to you on these. Um, Theo asked James, well, Theo asked the panel, have you seen big changes in dynamic or tactics of rugby caused by data? And Julian um, has a general question for James um, in how the halftime team talks have changed or become more refined over the years. So question one was about the big changes or tactics of rugby caused by data. How has that <laughs> changed? And question two from Julian to James was halftime talk. So perhaps if we start with James, um, and if anyone wants to jump in, uh, this is probably time where the last question we can take. But we do promise the audience we will come back to them on the others. So, James. Uh, look, I think the, the, the probably the biggest and most obvious one that, that um, I guess has been data driven a little bit, but it, it's not in a sense, it, it's probably looking at things like ruck speed. So obviously, um, there, you know, there's a correlation between the team being able to slow an opposition's ruck ball down to 
you know, being able to get your defensive line set. Uh, a lot of that is probably driven from a rugby league sort of background where you try and slow the play, the ball down to allow your defensive line to get set. So I think probably the the one thing that's certainly happened in my career was was about working on slowing the ball down to a certain number. Now, there's, you know, there, there are numbers that are thrown around and the numbers of, of, of the, the ruck speed. And, and for those that don't, aren't aware of rugby, ruck, ruck speed is once the ball, once a player's been tackled, how quickly that ball then gets released out of what is known as a ruck to the to the to to play on. Now, the, the numbers have always changed. And I think in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, that the number of what the ultimate ruck speed is. and um, But ultimately, the quicker you can have your ruck as the attacking team, the, more, the less likely a defence is to get set. And as defences, as tactically teams are spending a lot more time on their defence um, and defences are becoming more stringent, the, the quicker your ruck is, the, the more unstructured uh, defences you're playing against. Therefore, that leads to ultimately, you know, there's a, there's a correlation between winning games or, or going close to winning games. So that would probably be particularly in my career, and, and I think as you look back, that there's much more of an emphasis on players and there's certainly tactics around that that individuals and teams implement to, to slow the ball down. And particularly, you know, when coming to Quinns with the team that we had, you know, with, with guys like your Danny Cares, Mike Browns, these sort of players that, you know, play a very up-tempo, fast game, that the implementing of teams attempting tactics to, to slow our ball down was cer certainly something we would have to deal with on a, on a weekly basis. So I think that's probably the, the main difference I've seen over my career that's probably been, to an essence, uh, data-driven because, the, you know, it's something you can time um, from when the, the player hits the ground to when the ball is released to, to the next op to the next. Uh, Attacking player, it gives you an average ruck speed, and you know you go into games wanting to keep rucks, you know, below three seconds or above three seconds or above two and a half seconds, depending on the weather. Obviously, has a huge impact uh, and other other you know things that impact the game. So that that would probably be the bit, the main one. Um, and what about your halftime talks? Do you think they've they've evolved through data or just generally? I mean, how has it affected that? Um. Well, I think the, the ability to get the live data is probably the thing that's maybe impacted team talks. I don't know if they've uh, impacted uh, mine or the captains per se, but it, it would probably impact and it definitely would impact the way the messaging from the coaches if they were trying to uh, reinforce a point. A lot of the time you can see things that are going on. You know, if you're if players are spending too long on the ground and not getting back on their feet back into the game, you know, that sort of stuff that's very hard to get live, but you can, you, you can see that you, you know, their, their line out percentage, for example, is, is poor at the front. You know, you don't need a number to tell you that they're not winning. They're not winning line outs at a certain area of the, of the pitch. You can see that live. So I think the, the data is more there designed to reinforce the impact or the tactical mouse if needed. But Again, a lot of the time it, it's driven by the individual and the people and that's where I guess the coaches and their assistants are in the position they're in because they can see these things live and probably don't need the, the data in their own self because they can see that the data probably just allows to reinforce what they're thinking, what they're seeing and whether that's being passed on um, and whether they're, they're seeing it correctly. But I, I think from a, from a player's or a captain's team talk, I, I think you know, there is an element of, of that certainly and you, you work through things like possession, territory, um, ball in play. These sort of things are quite useful to get live. But again, a lot of that is, is, is sort of feel for the game, particularly if you've been, you know, playing for a while, you sort of get a feel for what's going on in the game and you probably, again, don't, the data is just there to, to reinforce what you're seeing and what you're feeling as a, as a player or a coach. James, thank you. And, and apologies, I, we're just at time, guys, and, and I think we'll have to bring this pure this to a conclusion. But I'd love to start by saying I'm excited by the future of data. And data is truly just the beginning. You know, words have come up, strategy, trust, human sources, context, new technologies. Um, and I, I'd love to quote some of our panelists today. So Sally said, AI isn't the silver bullet. And that goes along really well with what Jeff said about data being the journey and, and the trust. Um, Tom, I mean, this is 
best best term I've heard in years is data driven people business. I mean, that's going to stay with me. And James said rugby. So thank you. No, thank you very much, James. It was all very insightful. Um, earlier, I, I briefly alluded when I introduced Jeff to Refinitiv Data Exploration Tool. This is a great example of some of the work we do at Refinitiv. It's a fantastic way for companies and individuals to connect with the data as well. Um, so the tool is something we, was a proof of concept from our Refinitiv Labs where, where Jeff is up in London. And the objective was to solve some of these core data experience challenges our customers have. Um, through this tool, you can access um, digital content and services catalog with sample data hosted in different cloud environments. Um, and there are made, tested Jupyter notebooks um, with data structure and samples to help. Um, so the, at the end of this session, there'll be a, a pop-up survey. Um, please click yes if you'd like someone to contact you regarding Refinitiv data. Alternatively, please contact your account manager or visit the lab's website at labs.refinitiv.com. And uh, perhaps actually there might be time for one more question. Um, I'm going to, I found one from, sorry, Dan, do, I can't, do you have any questions available? I mean, we've got five minutes. I think we can squeeze another question in. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the, the question around um, how you get um, players to, or coaches to look at data when they, they say they want to use more traditional techniques, I think there was a, a parallel there with, you know, I'd be interested to hear Jeff and and uh, Sally's approach to, uh, you know, where their stakeholders are perhaps, you know, used to more traditional techniques, how they've seen um, themselves and, and their clients work with, with, with those sort of stakeholders. Thanks. So, so perhaps we start with Sally this time and then back to Jeff. Yeah, uh, we have seen a lot of resistance sometimes for techniques in AI, especially deep learning, because it can feel like a magical black box. But fundamentally, some techniques that existed before, especially in the computer vision space, just couldn't do the job. So sometimes we do get resistance in businesses, even if it does meet their business goals and it is innovative and it would differentiate that business. And in the case, it's similar to how Tom goes about it. It's the communication. It's the science communication. This is what it can do. This is its strengths and this is its weakness. And it's just repeatedly communicating what it can and can't do and presenting it in a realistic manner. That's how I try to get buy-in, but I'd be interested to see how Jeff copes with it. Thanks, Sally. Jeff? It's yeah. I mean, it's a great question, and I think it's a really interesting problem for for everyone. I mean, we we actually have a and there's another webinar on this actually, uh, which we didn't we didn't prepare beforehand. But there is a webinar on what we call design thinking, um, and really it's about starting being very um, user centric with what you're trying to solve. So we have a user experience research team and a user uh, interface design team, and you know we 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 don't bring the data out front. We don't think of the algorithm and the data science up front. We start with the problem and we, you know, we ask the user to explain, you know, everything that you do in your day. Uh, what are the decisions that you make? What are the tools that you use? What are the patterns that you go through when you're doing your work or making your decision? And then we look there to find where should we apply data or tools to help uh, enhance that. And if you realize, you know, well, I, I need to save time to get this data to give to a senior manager, you know, that's a different decision than if, you know, I need to make a decision in, uh, you know, a millisecond to make an, a, a decision about a, a trade. Those are two very different types of decisions. Um, and you might use a very different data, uh, data approach, data science approach to solve those problems. And it's about, as, as Tom and, and James, I can tell you, it, it's all about the person that is going to use that tool, use that insight. Um, is that you know? Don't start with data. Start with you know the problem. Um, and I think you know we've oriented our whole lab to be focused on that. Right. Start there. Um, and I think if people are want to think about how do you how do you get more data science or more AI used by the business, actually don't start there. Start with uh, their needs, the business needs, the problem you're trying to solve, uh, and use these uh, design thinking approaches. And, and I think. You know, it's amazing the results that, that come through switching your, your mindset uh, to focus on that. We still bring lots of great data into it, uh, but you have to you have to sort of, you know start differently. Thank you, thank you, Jeff, and then thank you, Sally. 
Um, what a fantastic note to, to conclude our session on. We're extremely proud partners of the Harlequins and excited to be working with innovative organizations such as Cambridge Consultants. Thank you everyone for tuning in and a big thanks to our wonderful panelists. Um, goodbye everyone, please stay safe. Thank you.